great day, and it's an absolute privilege to be able to speak to you all today on, on uh, Resurrection Sunday. I love Easter, and when I first became a Christian, I loved Easter especially because of this concept that Jesus came and fulfilled the law. And I thought, oh, that's excellent. Now it's finished, I don't have to read it. I don't have to read that boring part of the Bible anymore, but as you'll figure out today, it's actually a little bit more important than that. And I figured that out just yesterday. No. Who saw the blood moon last night? Yes. Who saw that? I saw it right out at 11 p.m. Did anyone know that yesterday was actually the Passover? Yes. Isn't that great? Now, I, I, just, this is just, I just remembered this a second ago. But there's something very interesting about the Passover. You see, it was the very first festival that the Jews had. And, I mean, for those of you that, that might not know this already, but it was, a, it was incredible foreshadowing of Jesus coming. And as you know, Jesus took the Passover. That's what the bread and wine was just before he got crucified. And it's funny because it's the only festival in the, all of, because the Jews have a bunch of festivals, but it's the only festival where you can actually convert to being a Jew. Did anyone know that? It's the only festival. So if you were a Gentile and you wanted to become a Jew, you would have to go and get circumcised, say all the right things, look Jewish, and then you have to actually partake in the Passover. And that is how you became a Jew. And today, we have a similar Passover, and that's Jesus. And that's how we become a Christian. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now I'll get on with my sermon. <laughs> Amen. So today I want to talk about the fulfillment of the law. Not in a boring way, not in a condemning way. But I just want to highlight something that, that I didn't know for years as a Christian. And that is what Jesus came to do, and that was fulfilling the law. So, for those of you that are familiar with Matthew chapter 5, 17, you can all turn there if you'd like. I think this is a good way to start the day. And I can read it if you like. You don't have to all go there. I'll just read it for you. Save you some time. Okay. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So there's actually two things there that he mentioned that he's fulfilling. One is the prophets, which we all, we all know because he's Jesus and he's there. and He, you know, he, he fulfilled that. He's, he's real. And the second thing was the law. You see, the law, well, we all know what the law was, the Old Testament. It's a big, long bunch of rules and, and it's just incredibly hard to follow. And in fact, I don't think there's anyone in this room who's ever even bothered trying. Has anyone refused to eat pork? Has anyone? Or has anyone refused to get piercings or tattoos? Or anyone not work on a Sabbath? No? Okay, good. So we're all in the same boat here. We're all Gentiles. So Jesus actually came to fulfill the law. When I first heard this, I thought, okay. So he, he, was, he was a good, good kid, basically. He, he came in, he fulfilled it. He did all the right things. He followed the rules. He, he was obedient. But, but he broke the rules. He actually went around and did the wrong things. Like he was healing on the Sabbath and he was letting his disciples eat without washing their hands. I mean, these are things people got stoned for. And here's Jesus, the Son of God, coming along and breaking them. And how does someone fulfill the law and break it? I mean, that just puzzled me, so I just sort of ignored it. But I'm going to be explaining that now. I want to talk to you a little bit about what that really means for someone to fulfill the law. See, I originally thought, well... To fulfill a rule or a law or something would simply be to, to, to well, obey it. So if, if Mark said, Stephen, where is Mark? Is he here? Is he gone? He's right on. Cooking. cooking. Oh, he's cooking. Oh, okay. If Mark said, Stephen, do not eat that cake in the fridge. And I said, yes, Mark, I will not eat that cake. I will be faithful and I'll fulfill that rule and never eat it. You see, I fulfilled that rule and that's my... Well, that's my thinking, that that's what Jesus did. He, he fulfilled the rules that were in place. You see, that's not actually what he meant. He didn't mean that he was obeying the rules. He didn't mean that he was following them to the T. He actually meant that he completed them, he finished them. Not to make them redundant or irrelevant, but to actually fulfill the purpose of what they were made for. So, the law, I'm going to be saying the law a lot, by the way, so if you, I'm sorry if you get sick of that. So, the law, they were all familiar with in the Old Testament, was actually a guardian. 
if you, if you turn to, to Galatians 3.24, Paul actually says this exact thing. He actually tells the, the people in Galatia that the law was a guardian. It was there to protect God's people. Now you think about what a guardian is. It's, it's someone who's covering and protecting. And we've got Cain, he's a bodyguard. What's, what does it mean to guard someone? Guard something. You look after me. You could be my bodyguard. How much do you pay? How much do I pay per hour? Well, you for free. Oh, for free. Thank you. Okay. So we know what a guardian is. It's, a, it's a something that protects, something that's kind of keeping it safe. And that's what the law was. It was to keep God's people safe. I mean, why? Well, how does a bunch of weird rules keep people safe? You see, often we associate sin with breaking the rules. But that's actually not the case at all. Sin isn't defined by someone who breaks the rules. We often think that because of because of Adam broke the first rule. But if you look at another one, Romans 5.13, which I've got here somewhere, or not, probably don't. I'll say it off the top of my head. Romans 5.13, Paul actually says that the, the law was around, so the sin was around before the law even came. But it just wasn't counted because there was no law. So obviously there was already sin. But we just had no means of knowing what it was or how to avoid it. And see, that's what the law did. It provided a way for God's people to know, oh, that's bad, that's good, don't do that, let's go this way instead. And so that's how it protected them, by protecting them. So the same way that we tell our kids, look left and right before you cross the road. You know, Little things like that to actually help them from stumbling. Because they were very prone to stumbling, as we know. As we all are. You see... The law was originally intended to keep God's people safe from sin. So the, the real purpose of the law was to make them holy. And um, I know this, this many of you probably not, uh, well, I probably shouldn't say that because some of you are probably very familiar with the book of Leviticus. It's a, it's a very, very long, very uh, exciting book, as you all know. And... Uh, a few years ago, on, uh, on my Bible school, we had to read through the entire thing in one sitting. So to sit down and read it without stopping. And one of the lecturers told us to grab a highlighter and highlight every time the word holy came up. And I pretty much ran out of highlighter. It was, it was it's just ridiculous. I, the book was just basically yellow. It was, I should have just scribbled the whole thing in. Because, you see, the, the whole theme of the book was to make God's people holy. Every second word, every, basically every sentence was, do this and this and this to be holy. You need to be holy, so da 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 da. And be holy and da 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 da. And the priest will do this, so da 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 da. They're holy, you know. It's just holy, holy, holy. Everything was about being holy. Oops. So, this was the purpose of the law. So, how did Jesus fulfill that purpose? Well, hey, he was holy, he was perfect. You see, he didn't actually need the law to protect him. I mean, I mean, imagine that. I mean, Jesus needs something he created to protect him from, well, it seems a little bit redundant, doesn't it? You see, often we get this, the law in the wrong kind of position on the, on, the, on, the, on the chain of command, you see. We put the law at the top, and then we put principles and the purpose underneath. But the purpose of the law is, is actually on top, because that's the reason it was created. And that's what Jesus realized. And that's what he came to well, reveal to us. So when he was healing people on the Sabbath, he was saying, well, I'm still being holy, so therefore I'm not actually sinning. So I don't need this law to tell me what, what to do, because I already know what's holy. You see, Jesus had it ingrained in, in him to know what was right and wrong, to know what was, what was holy and what was righteous and what was good. Not because he was simply God, but... Because, well, yeah, okay, yeah, he was simply God, but he had the Holy Spirit. He was being guided. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, just a little bit more, in a minute. So, I guess the main theme, the main thing I want to try and bring to our attention today is, is this little concept, which is really hard to kind of niggle out. But it's this concept of, really, what the whole purpose of the law is. And now... I'd like to kind of illustrate this a little bit better and say, well, we still actually have law, and we still follow law all the time. In fact, you know, our government is based on the law of God. 
If anyone's realised that, I mean, we have laws in our government, you know, do not murder, do not do all these things that are actually in our government. It's been based off that law. We're continually following the law. In fact, the law is still good and it should still be used. In fact, Paul actually says in Romans, I think, over there, he says that that the law is actually for uh, so the the, the that we don't need the law, but it's still good for people that aren't dwelling in Christ. Because they still need something to protect them. You see? So there's still, a, there's still a place for it. But it's actually not more important than holiness. So, and this is where, you know the term, and we're all familiar with the term, being religious. And we all know what that means. And someone's being really religious where they, where they take the rules, and these rules are more important than anything else. Doesn't matter what your intentions are, we follow the rules. Now, I want to show you a little video. Everyone get excited because you don't have to listen to me anymore. Well, you, afterwards you will. Now, this video is from a TV series. Oh, wait a minute. Item the matter of the town. Can you pause it for a second? Versus parcel one one four two three. Okay, there we go. All right. I'll just explain what it is first, so we don't get a little bit lost. This this uh, clip here is is from a little TV series called Gilmore Girls. Has anyone heard of Gilmore yes. Girls? Okay, it's, it's a very funny little series. It's about a, a mom and a daughter who live in this little small town community. And in this community, they have these town meetings. And, and they have this, well, town selectman who's the kind of like the, I guess, the mayor. And everyone hates him because he's an absolute stickler. Like, he just, he follows everything to the T to a point of it being a little bit ridiculous. So, we'll have a little look and I'll show you exactly what I mean. And you're a really good example of religious. So we can play that video now. Like irresponsible, devil may care majority. Now we move on to the next item. The matter of the town stars hollow versus land parcel 11423-A. Is the parcel holder present? If that's me, I'm here. The parcel holder is present. Now, said parcel is cited as being in violation of section 423, subsection 4C, subsection 32-B, formerly known as section 424, subsection... Enough. Yeah, this is more painful than ticks. So the parcel holder requests that the reading of the citation be waived? Wave it, wave it. Just tell me what the hell's wrong with my greenhouse. It's built too close to the edge of your property. It's miles away from the edge of my property. It's nine and a half feet from the edge of your property. Exactly. According to town codes, no new structure can come within 10 feet of the edge of your property. Oh, that's a technicality. No, that's the law. And as town selectman, it's up to me to see that you abide by it. Unbelievable! There's a simple solution if you want to hear it. I do, yes. Just move it over six inches. Oh, well, you should have just said that before. Yeah, perhaps I should. Just move the greenhouse over six inches. That's right. Good thing I built it on wheels so I could just scooch it over. Oh, it's on wheels? No, it's not on wheels! Because wheels would have been handy. I would have to tear it down to move it over six inches, Taylor. Mmm, too bad you didn't check with me before you built it. Could have saved you some heartache. Okay, that's not English, hon. Come on, Taylor, this is ridiculous. This issue is not open for debate. This is a nice man who's growing some very nice tomatoes, and you just need to oil your knees and go, go see the wizard and get a heart and drop this. What is this, Lorelei? Lingering resentment over the parking space issue? Well, come on, you rejected it because I left out my middle name. How many other Lorelei Gilmores do you know? Well, irresponsible, <laughs> definitely <laughs> care, majority. That's it, that's the... Now that's we it. move on to... Okay. Pause now, if you like. So, there you have it. We have uh, Mr. Taylor there, who's, uh, I guess, condemning and enforcing the law upon the town, much to their dismay. And I'd like to point out this, to me, is a perfect illustration of someone being religious. You see, this is a perfect illustration of someone who's taken the law and said, this is more important than the reason it was made. You see, obviously, the reason that they had a law that you couldn't build anything 10 feet to the edge of your property was so that you didn't disrupt the peace, obviously. And now, ironically, he's doing exactly that by forcing this guy to rip up his greenhouse and move it this far. You know? <laughs> okay, so there. I just wanted to show you that because I thought it's a... I think we, we all know, you know, there's always going to be someone like that and sometimes we're a bit like that. We start to follow the rules a little bit too vigorously. So, with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about 
what Jesus did and how he fulfilled the law and what alternative we now have. You see, Jesus didn't just come, show off and say, look how holy I am and then scooch off back to heaven. No, he actually came down, he gave us a, a brilliant example of how to live and he fulfilled the law and then he said, okay, now you guys can do it too. You guys can be just like me. In fact, he even said that we could do greater things than him. And that's, that's pretty cool. That's encouraging. And what he did just before he left, as many of you know, is he, he gave us the Holy Spirit. We sent the Holy Spirit so that we could live holy and righteous. Has anyone ever wondered why we call him the Holy Spirit? Well, he's holy. Yeah. He's, yeah, go, go figure. You see, in the Old Testament, the law, the entire purpose of the law was to make us holy, was to make us righteous, to keep us from sin. And now, we couldn't do that. So Jesus came and he's given us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can actually make us holy. There we go. There's a nice little link. So the law and the Holy Spirit really have the exact same purpose. The law is a good thing, but we have something better. We've got the Holy Spirit. So I just want to point out a few things. And I didn't really feel to, to share this just before, but I really feel that there's, there's, a, real, there's a real big, heavy sense of, of guilt on a lot of people here. There's a real sense of, 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 of heaviness. And it comes from not knowing your worth and your value. You see, the Holy Spirit came for, for, for many reasons. But if you look at 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it's the very last verse of 2 Corinthians. Paul sums up the purpose of the Trinity very well. He says, may you, may you go in the, the love of God and the grace of Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be our friend. The Holy Spirit is supposed to dwell with us, to walk with us. I'm sure you've heard this before, but he's not there to, to make us... You know, powerful, incredible people. No, in fact, the main purpose of the Holy Spirit was actually to improve our character. It was actually to make us holy, to make us free. Sin is, is really a trap. It's a, it's a bondage. And guilt is a part of that. Guilt is a part of, of sin. You see, Jesus said that there is no guilt. He took it with him. He took it with him to the cross. Now, I know many of you, and when I first became a Christian, one of the the biggest struggles I had was coming to God after I sinned. If I had done something wrong, I used to be terrified of God coming into God's presence because I would think, if I go and try and spend time with God now, oh, he's going to hate me. You know, I'm this horrible person. I'm like, yeah, I know that's not really true, but I kind of feel like that. You know, and I'd feel horrible. And, and I'd sort of put it off and put it off and be like, oh, I'll just wait till I'm, I'm, I'm a bit better, till I do I'm a bit better of a person. And then I'll go spend time with God. Then I'll go pray and, and seek Him and, and talk with Him because then He won't be upset with me. But you see, it doesn't work like that. God's not waiting for you to be good enough. In fact, that's the exact reason that He's there. Because we're not good enough. He knows that you've stuffed up. He knows all the ridiculous things that, that we've all done. And that's why he's, he's waiting for us to just give up. Waiting for us to go, Oh God, I'm stuffed up completely. <laughs> I've, you know, I kicked the dog and swore at my neighbour and oh, I just gave my daughter the wrong haircut and snipped off a ponytail and everyone hates me. I'm such a sinner. And you know, God's like, yeah, come on, I know. Yep, that's why I'm here. <laughs> you see, and we know that. But we often forget that for, for no other reason except that we're feeling guilty. You see, and, uh, many of you know from Romans 8.1, there is no more con condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we think, oh, am I in Christ Jesus? Am I really? I wasn't really in Christ Jesus today, this morning. No, but you are. Yes. If, you've, if you've given your life to Him, if you've proclaimed that with your mouth, then you are final. Yes. That's it. There's really no other, no other thing to it. <laughs> I hope that's encouraging. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> it is. So there's one more verse, actually probably a few more, but there's one I'd like to point out, and that's, this verse has stuck with me ever since I first became a Christian. And that's Galatians 5.16. As probably many of you know, it says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not 
fulfill the desires of the flesh or the sinful nature or whichever translation. Now, what does that mean? That means that by living by the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be living in sin. So that, you know, because Paul says our flesh is, is, is dead, but the Spirit that lives in us is life. Therefore, though we are dead, though we are these, you know, rotten little things, the Holy Spirit is actually our life. We're not really counting on much else except for Him. Anyway, there's a few more things I want to point out. I love pointing things out. I love pointing out anomalies and, and funny little things that we don't often realize. You see, there's, there's a great verse. I think it's Romans 13. Actually, I reckon we should turn there. Let's all open Romans 13, verse 10. Oh, no, no, not that one. That's the wrong one. No, Romans 8.14, that's it. Got it. It's a very short verse. It's very simple. But I think everyone here needs to hear this one because I think this is something that we forget very, very often. Okay, Romans 8.14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Excellent. Isn't that great? You know, it goes on to say, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. What does that mean? And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now, there's, there's something there we've probably heard many times. But I just want to highlight the fact that you're actually a child of God. Yes. Now, we've heard this a lot. We've heard, oh, we're, we're, we're children of God. We're, we're chosen and we're, we're you know, loved and cherished and all that. Sure, but God loves everyone, right? Well, guess what? God hasn't actually created anything better than you. There is nothing else that God has created that is more valuable and that is more important to Him than us than to you, to humans. Has anyone ever thought that? The devil has spent thousands of years trying to convince us that we aren't actually that important. Think about that. This is God we're talking about. He was never even created. Everything that's been created was created through him. And the most treasured thing he's ever made is us. More so, he actually made us in his image. Okay, do you know what that means? Oh, this is, this is pretty challenging. Now, dogs have puppies. Cats have kittens. What does God have? Children. <laughs> he has us. We have miniature gods made in His likeness. Or, well, you know, little G gods. <laughs> it's true. No, there's actually... Can anyone name anything else that God has created that has the ability to create? No, we're the only things that can create. Isn't that amazing? You could give a, get a beaver. He can't paint a picture. He can't create something new. He just does what he does. You know, kangaroo, he just hops. He doesn't decide, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some of that bark there, and I'm going to make some nice shoes, and then I'll be able to jump over those hard rocks over there. No, they don't create. They don't invent. They just do. We're the only things in this world that have the ability to create. Has anyone ever really dwelled on that? See, God is the creator of everything. And the only other... Thing in this world that has that same ability as us. We are the most valuable thing to God. Amen. We're the most valuable thing. We share His, his emotions. We share His feelings. Amen. You see, nothing else can, can share in how God feels. See, when God feels sad, we understand that because we understand what that emotion is and why God feels sad. So all through the Bible, God is very emotional. He expresses His emotions. And we understand that. No one else does it. Your cat, your dog, they don't understand that. It's, it's us that understand that. It's, it's us, his children, who were made in his image. That's how valuable you are. There is, there is no one less valuable than anything on this earth. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you are just the absolute bottom of the food chain. There's not a, not a dinosaur or, a, or a, a farm animal or anything that's more valuable than any human. Because nothing has that image of God. So it doesn't matter how much you've been lied to. It doesn't matter how much the devil has tried to just stomp down 
and make you think that you haven't got any worth. It's true. You're a child of God. Amen. You've inherited a part of Him. And that's the next part of that, that verse there is we're, we're heirs. Fellow heirs with Christ. You know who Christ is? He's God. So we're heirs with God. So we've actually inherited everything. We've inherited existence. We've inherited everything that's impossible, sorry, everything that's possible to inherit, we've inherited it. Simply because we are His children. Let that sink in for a little bit. Do you know that this entire earth is ours? You know, we've got some incredible, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm all for the environment and, and you know, maintaining God's creation, but there are people who, who want to try and convince us that a whale is more important than a human life. Not true. Not even close. In fact, we own that whale. It belongs to us because it's, it's a thing. It's created, therefore we've inherited it. Everything that you can look at, everything that you can think of, and everything that you can touch, you've inherited. You, you, you're basically kings and, and queens of everything because we're God's children. Amen. Do you realize how, how valuable we are? Yeah. We're not just, just some little suit of flesh that wobble around and make mistakes and, and God's just pitied us and, and oh, all these poor little weakling things will just do something to help them feel better. No, we're actually His children. Okay, so I think I've let that I've express that point enough. All right. And unfortunately, we're children that have made a mistake. We're children that have, that have sinned. And it's a glorious day. In fact, this is the most important day in the entire year that we can celebrate. Isn't it? It's the day that we have become that inheritance. It's the day that we've, we've actually been given that inheritance and that value from Jesus. This is the day that he, he rose from the dead. This is the day that... Everything that, that we are worth is now given to us on this day. Everything that's worth celebrating is celebrated today. And that's Easter. And you see, I want to just sort of finish now on, on a little bit of the Holy Spirit. A little bit more on His purpose. Because we can talk about the Holy Spirit all we like. But it needs to be practical. It needs to be relevant. And I want to just tell you how relevant He actually is. You see, we just saw this video of Taylor and, and his very, very strict rules and making everyone else abide by the, the town law. And, and he even heard him say it. He said, that's the law. You have to be inconvenienced because it's the rules. You see, living like that is always going to end up in the same place. And that is just stuck in a rut in sin. And you read the entire Old Testament, you, you'll find out that, yeah, the Jews pretty much ended up exactly like that. They just couldn't get out of this rut. You see, but the Holy Spirit has given us freedom from the law by being the law for us. And if you go to Galatians 5.22, it tells you exactly how He does that. So for those of you that know that that's, that's the fruit of the Spirit. We all know that. You know, love, peace, joy, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, goes on. This is what the Holy Spirit gives us. You notice something interesting. Do you realize that that's called the fruit of the Spirit? Now, now if, I, if I just sort of recall a little, little phrase, you know when someone says, the, the fruit of your labor, what does that mean? It's, it means what you've created, you've, your, your profits, the, the fruit of what you have done, the reward of your hard work, that's the fruit of your labor. Well, that's not what this is. The Holy Spirit is not talking you know, it's about fruit. You know, when Jesus talks about fruit, He's actually not talking about the fruit of your labor. He's not talking about your works. He's not. He's talking about a different type of fruit. So in our, our concept, immediately when we think of fruit, we think very practically, you plant something, it grows, you get fruit, so you get production, you get something that's producing. Well, Jesus didn't say that only those who produce come to heaven. He didn't actually say that. Hey, look, it's nice. Look, it's good to have someone who can produce. And some of you is gifted incredibly to, to, to do amazing things. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fruit of your heart and the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about your character. The character fruit. Fruitful character. I mean, because, I mean, what's this? Love, joy, peace? Are they, are they fruits? Are they labor? Is that something that you, you, you create? 
They don't really go around creating joy and peace and love and kindness. No, you, you, you become it. It's, it's, it's what you take on. It's, it's the fruit of your heart. It's the fruit of your character. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to, to give us, well, to, to show us that our, our, well, our hard work should be put into our heart, not our, not our hands and feet. You know, it's good to be diligent. And honestly, if, if you put into your heart, then it affects everything else anyway. If you're a lazy person and you're putting in love and kindness and peace and all this fruit into your heart, you're not going to be lazy anymore. A loving, gentle, kind person isn't a lazy person. It, it all gets solved. It's just like how, how Paul said in Romans 13. Romans 13, 10. I'm going to check that. Just don't, don't want to misquote you guys. He said that, oh, well, I know it anyway. He said that love fulfills, no, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, fulfilling the law. Isn't that incredible? We've got this whole Old Testament, and all that God had to say was, I just love your neighbor. Oh, it would have saved me some time. <laughs> Could have just told me that. It would have saved heaps of time. But you see, that, that's the whole purpose of what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to give us rules. I mean, can anyone think of a single rule or law that, that Jesus gave? He gave us some great principles. He told us to love. He told us to be kind. He told us to do all kinds of things. But he never really gave us a rule. He never told us... I love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. New commandment. Like New commandment. So he's given us one. Oh, you guys, you got me. All right. I better, I better finish now. Heathen. Uh, can't even quote the scripture. No, but you see, Jesus, he gave us this, this new commandment. He gave us these, these, these guidelines, but really they were principles. He didn't tell us how to eat, how to drink, how to walk. He didn't tell us how to tie a shoelace. He was just giving us principle after principle. He let his disciples eat without washing their hands. It's a little bit gross, but I mean, back then they probably hadn't showered for weeks, you know. And here they, here they were just stuffing food in their mouth. Jesus didn't care. They were breaking all the rules, but he didn't care because it wasn't about that. It was about their heart. And right after they did that, you know what he said? Oh, it's, not, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you... What is it? Yes, it's what comes out of your mouth. Exactly. So he made a very, very good point there. That, that's pretty much the entire message of, of what he did, why he came to earth. He said, you guys got it all wrong. You think that the law makes you a sinner. No. Sin makes you a sinner. The law is just telling you that you are. You know, and just because you're following the rules, it doesn't mean you're not a sinner. I mean, he called the Pharisees some pretty vile things, you know. And he condemned them. And then sitting there thinking, I did all, all the right things. I bore and I... Did the Sabbath and I acted holy and fasted and did all these ridiculous things and I'm a sinner? Because they put the law up here and they put holiness down there. And we can do that as soon as we value law more. So um, I'd just like to ask the team to come. The band, if that's okay. I want to offer you guys just a chance to respond. Now, it's a great day. I think it's a they're all right. You guys don't mind, do you? Okay, good. Thank you. I want to give you guys just a chance to, to really respond and to make a bit of a declaration. <coughs> now, we can all we can pretend, but I'll be honest that we all do it, and I do it. We often put rules above the purpose of them. We often try to 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 to, to condemn either someone else or ourselves according to rules. And not according to what's right and wrong, not according to holiness or righteousness, because that's God's ultimate plan. He doesn't, he doesn't want goody two shoes. He doesn't want little law abiding soldiers. He wants he wants holy, righteous children that imitate him. So today I just want to give you guys an opportunity. We'll play, play some music and, and I want to give you guys an opportunity to come to the front and, and just worship God again. Worship God like we did this morning, but with your mouth and with your heart, make a declaration to, to the Holy Spirit. And say, Holy Spirit, I can't follow the law, but I gladly follow you. Come up and whatever it is, if you need to say sorry, then say sorry. Or if you just want to ask the Holy Spirit to, to continue guiding you, if you feel like you, you haven't given him enough room to give you that fruit, then, then give it to him. I want to give you guys that chance today.
And I'd also like to ask the, the, the team, the prayer team, if they can come. And, and if you want some prayer, then grab them by the collar and pull them over and we'll pray for you too. So we'll do that now if that's all right.